Okay, I think it's time to start. No announcement, I was told. And uh, I just wanted to say a few words. Uh, I was not so lucky to be uh, an Italian student, <laughs> but I, I can tell, so I, I, I will mention other aspects. Uh, you know most of them, and I think you know all of them, one is the passion and the sensitivity for art that you can see from the book that which was prepared for this reading. Uh, it was just a small part of the collection which could stay in, in every museum. And uh, the sensitivity and passion for music. Uh, the concert of yesterday was uh, uh, organized in uh, just and uh, which is uh, the most important <coughs> thing is the, the empathy he has for other people. And uh, it's not uh, uh, just by chance that in, in the many paintings in, uh, in the booklet, uh, all the, some are devoted to the family, but some to friends and other people. So, and, and I can uh, testify Two years ago, I was I, had, I was in Israel. He was not in Israel, and I I needed some help. And he, uh, from far, he provided that help, showing this uh, one of these infinitely many dimensions of his personality. Thank you very much. So we can. One, two. Okay. Um, so I was too so lucky to be Vitali's student. Maybe let me say just one short thing about it or two. Uh, first of all, if it hadn't been for Vitali, right now I'm pretty sure I would have been either a physicist or, God forbid, not in academia at all. So uh, I decided to attend it was like a complete random decision to attend the Vitali seminar as an undergrad when I was really thinking I'm gonna continue to a master's degree in physics and it was really a hundred percent thanks to Vitali's inspiration and passion and charisma that really drew me to realize that I actually prefer to do math and I'm pretty glad I did that pretty happy where I am, so thanks for that. And the second thing I wanted to say is that, you know, uh, my, being Vitali's student is kind of like a joker card wherever you go in the sense that when you're a young mathematician, you go to travel to different universities and, you know, you meet more senior mathematicians, like big and important ones. And when you talk to them, you want to ask a question, you always feel like you're kind of like a little pest. You're, you, you, it's kind of awkward to, I guess many of us had this experience, but my experience is always that when I mention, the minute I mention Vitali's name, I, it, and it's, it's not necessarily to people in functional analysis, it's people in statistics, PDEs, machine learning, whatever, I always immediately get a big smile and I feel completely welcome and you know, I, I just love that. It's like a, really a joker card that I like having. So, okay, this is what I wanted to say and let me now start uh, the talk, unless there are questions about this intro. <laughs> um, okay, so our setting is the following. So throughout the talk, we are going to have some potential function uh, f. Uh, 
<laughs> Is there such a thing? <laughs> they, they all look alike, so I, I can just randomly try another, but bigger? OK, I'll try. So we have a potential f, which could be on either, um, usually it would be on minus 1, 1 to the n, so on the discrete hypercube. But it could also be on Rn or on minus 1, 1 to the n, the continuous hypercube. There will be more examples, but these are the ones to keep in mind. And <clears throat> we're always going to have a, some background measure mu. So background, which could be, will be usually the uniform measure here. Here it could be the Gaussian, and here also usually the uniform measure, but let's not restrict ourselves to those cases. Usually let's think about the discrete hypercube with the uniform measure and some potential defined on it. And then we're going to consider the Gibbs measure defined by the equation d nu is just uh, some normalizing constant times e to the f d mu. So think of f as some Hamiltonian, and we have the corresponding Gibbs measure. And to, for this talk, we're going to think about two central tasks that we want to do with this Gibbs measure. So one task that many people are interested in, I guess, is, I guess, let me write it as a question. The question is to try to estimate or calculate, if possible, this uh, partition function ZF. And ZF is uh, a constant such that this thing is a probability measure. Actually, let me go back a bit for the questions. Let me just give you, uh, I guess, two examples to have in mind for what this potential f is. So uh, one example that we'll uh, talk about is when f is just quadratic. So f of x is just uh, x, j, x for some matrix j. And maybe also there's going to be some linear part, so h dot x for some vector h. In the case of the discrete hypercube, these guys are called uh, Ising models. And two examples of a matrix J to keep in mind, one is the all ones matrix. So I'm thinking about these, uh, the coordinates here as just a bunch of particles that could point up or down, for example. And J is some kind of interaction matrix between them. So if J is the all ones matrix, the system wants you know, all the particles to either point mostly up or mostly down. And another example is the, uh, say, two-dimensional ferromagnetic is in model in which your coordinates are, they represent the points of some grid. And the interaction matrix is just all the Z2 or Z3 or whatever edges between the points. So this is an interacting particle system which lives on, you know, the d-dimensional grid and we have these, so the matrix J, you know, these are the coordinates and the matrix J is such that you have ones on all of these edges, okay? Or some constant on, on all of these edges. And in, in these two cases that I mentioned, for example, let's try to imagine, you know, what one could, have, could try to do in order to estimate the function ZF even in the case of J being very simple, like the all ones matrix, this is, not, this is actually not such an easy task. 
Okay, so this is going to be the first thing that we keep in mind. And the second question that we want to ask here, which is really the main question, is the following. Can we, or in what way can we, decompose our measure mu into, so this is what physicists call pure states. And let me translate that for you. Is it big enough, Vitaly? Uh, it's close now by this. I respond after the ball. OK. Um, can we decompose it into pure states? Namely, what this talk is going to be about is we're going to try to write our measure nu as the sum of some measures nu i, or maybe let's put here alpha i nu i, where i goes between 1 and some capital N, where nu i are, again, probability measures. And we want this decomposition to satisfy two things. The first thing is we want capital N to be not so large. I want to decompose. Of course, I can always decompose my measures to measures supported just on one uh, atom, right? But our task is going to be to try to find such a de decomposition such that N is as small as possible. And by small, let's usually what we want to uh, think about here is that n is e to the little o of little n. <laughs> so you know I can all so in this case I can always take big n to be two to the n and just decompose it into into singletons. But I want to do you know better in the exponent. And the second requirement is I want uh, that for most i, new i is, let's call it localized. And what do we mean by localized? So I want, OK, I, w I want it to be a nice measure which is kind of local in space in some sense. And we were going to have several interpretations in this talk for number two here. The first interpretation, let's call it L1. This is usually what the, the this is the, I guess, most, most common interpretation for physicists is that uh, we have the following property that if x and y are both, uh, both have the law nu i and they are independent, then uh, the covariance, oh, actually, that's, uh, yes, the variance of x dot y, square root of this is a little o of 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 n. So a priori, if we have, you know, a measure on minus one one, it could be that the variance of this scalar product of this overlap between particles is, you know, it could be order n squared, right? If we have, for example, the measure is supported on two points, the you know, all ones and all minus. I want to do better than that. I want to have little o of that. Okay, this, this uh, you could, so, so what the, the way physicists would uh, say this is that the overlap is uh, deterministic or converges to something deterministic. Uh, the second property, L2, this is going to be a, a hierarchy of properties, really. The second one is that the covariance matrix 
of a new i is equal to little o of n times the identity. Or let, let's do, you know, in the positive definite sense. It's not hard to see that this implies this. This just says that, you know, if in the direction of its expectation, it's small. This says that in all directions, it's kind of small. L3 is going to be the following thing. So I want to, to, have, that, I, I want to have that for a typical <coughs> choice of a projection of my measure onto a finite set of coordinates. Or in other words, the typical choice of a finite set of particles are, all, are, are roughly independent. So for most i1 up to ik, where k is some constant, it's O of 1, we have that, uh, the, that uh, I guess, xi1 up to xik uh, where x is mu i distributed is I guess let's let's just just say approximately are are approximately independent In the sense that the total variation distance to some independent guys goes to zero. And the, the strongest guess type of uh, localization we're going to have is the following. There exists some product measure that's called psi such that the Wasserstein distance, the transportation distance between, I'll define it in a second, between mu i and psi, this guy is little o of n, where the transportation distance between two measures, uh, mu and mu prime, is defined as the supremum over, over functions which are one Lipschitz of not F but G. Where Lipschitz is so here it's going to be the Hamming distance, here it's going to be just the Euclidean distance. Um, I, we're not, I'm, I'm not saying anything quantitative right now, so I, better, I, I, I prefer to keep it you know, a bit informal at this point. Yeah? I don't understand two, you said for most new is more complicated. It can be that new is equal to new. Ah, mo most in the sense of measure, in the sense of the weight of alpha. The, yes, in the sense of weight of alpha i. Yes, most measure is supported on. Yeah. Sure. Any questions so far? And g is for any g one Lipschitz. So the supremum over one Lipschitz functions of this difference. Okay. Uh, what is C? What? I didn't understand the question, but I guess you're okay. In L4, it seems as if psi is the same for all i, the way you wrote it. Ah, psi, of course, depends on, ah, I see, I see, I see. Uh, I, we're, all of these properties are just properties of new i. And, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. 
Good. So uh, before we, before I start talking about the theorems we have in this direction, I want to motivate them by say, by telling you or at least giving you some intuition about how the answer to the second question really often gives an answer to the first question. And this is actually pretty simple. So I want to convince you that an answer to Q2 is helping us find an answer to Q1. And why is that true? This is based on a simple fact called the Gibbs variational principle. Which uh, tells us the following. It says that log of the partition function, which is just log of the integral of e to the f d uh, mu, is always equal, this is in a, the most general setting you like, to the supremum over measures new tilde of the following quantity, just the integral of f d new tilde plus the entropy of the entropy uh, with respect to the background measure mu. Uh, 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 yeah. Of the measure mu field. So why? Why is this helping us? So first of all, let's look at this formula for a minute. I want to calculate the left-hand side. Maybe let's try to you know, calculate the right-hand side instead. Well, here I just wanted to calculate some integral, but now I have to go over all the measures you know, on my space. It doesn't make so much sense, right? That this could be helpful somehow. I'll even tell you that this, this, by the way, is a simple fact proven by convexity. I guess most of you have seen it. If not, it's just an exercise. It's just the answer. Uh, the maximizer turns out to be the measure mu itself. So, you know, how can this be helpful? Well, the reason it is sometimes helpful is the following. Sometimes we have something called mean field approximation. Sometimes this supremum is really saturated by, by a simple class of measures, namely product measures. Okay, it could be the case that instead of checking all new fields, I just have to check product measures, and this is already much easier because this set is parameterized by, you know, just one point, at least in the case of the discrete hypercube, just by, by one point, which is the expectation of my measure, right? So this just becomes an optimization problem on the continuous hypercube, okay? So we have this in mind, we, we're hoping that you know, we don't have to check all measures, but we just need to check nice measures. And at this point, let's, let me take a, just a very small detour. Let's call this, uh, this equation star. And now let me just give you a slightly different type of decomposition. This will be a bit more convenient for us. Let's say that star star holds if nu is not decomposed into some finite set of measures, but it's really, it can be written as something like that. So it, I, I just want to change the sum by some integral. So I want to say that nu is equal to some the integral of, of mu theta d some measure on the index set theta. Okay. 
Okay, there, the, the, the difference between this and this is quite technical. It doesn't matter so much, okay? But what is this condition going to become if I allow, you know, my, if I allow my index set to be continuous and not discrete, the natural, uh, the natural counterpart to one is really the following thing. I want the expectation. <coughs> over where theta is m distributed of the entropy with respect to mu of uh, mu theta to be more or less equal to the just the entropy of nu. So note that by convexity, we always have that this is smaller than this. Condition two, condition one, I guess intuitively you can, and it can be easily made formal. You can, I guess you can believe me that this more or less corresponds to the opposite inequality, namely that I don't lose so much when going from the actual measure to you know, one of the components in the mixture. And when we write this, what corresponds to this is that this approximation is up to plus little over plus minus, but it's really just a plus. Okay. Good. So now that we slightly change our point of view, let's go back to the Gibbs variational uh, formula. And instead of taking a new tilde here, let's try to maximize over these approximate product measures obtained by those new theta. So what we can write is well we just observed that we have the following thing so the expectation with respect to m of the integral of f d new theta plus the entropy of nu theta. We want, we want to find some theta such that this inequality is more or less saturated. But, well, we have that in expectation, this is just equal to the right-hand side here up to the difference between the entropies. This is exactly what's written here. So we really have that this is approximately equal to the right-hand side, which is just log of Zf, right? So we now just care about this. But another thing we can observe is that if we define psi theta as the product measure such that the expectation of psi theta is just equal to the ex expectation of mu theta, then we have the following thing. If two measures have the same marginals, the one that whose coordinates are independent is always going to have a bigger entropy. So this guy is always going to be smaller or equal than the entropy with respect to new of psi theta. Okay? And what about this guy? So 
Now let's go back here. Oh, mu, sorry, of course. Let, let me just omit the mu. The entropy is always with respect to the background measure, not to confuse everyone. Uh, good. Now, suppose we have the best kind of approximation. We have L4. If we have L4 and the potential is Lipschitz, well, this exactly tells us that the integral of f d nu theta is close to the integral of f d xi theta. So we really only have to check those xi theta, namely we only have to check product measures, right? Now what if we don't have L4? Suppose we only have, say, L2. I'm, I'm not going to do this rigorously, but let me try to convince you that in this case, I can, there's, there, if, if uh, my potential is an ising potential, then in many cases, I, L2 is actually enough. So if F is, again, X, F of X, is again xjx for some matrix j, then it's not hard to check that the integral of f d mu theta minus the integral of f d, the corresponding product measure, is just equal to the trace of the matrix j times the covariance of uh, mu theta. So it's in that, so I guess let's, let's not do any calculations. If I have some bound on how big the covariance matrix is, and I also have some bound on the matrix J, then I can probably bound these two things. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to give you any details. I just want to, you know, convince you that this could, could be helpful. Any questions so far? Good. Uh, so this was kind of the motivation for to try to find some decomposition like we have here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. With which L? I don't know. Uh, so. L2 if you want. L2 is the is good enough. Uh, so for any J. So I'm actually going to answer your. I, I was going to answer it anyway. It's, so L1 up to L3 have nothing to do with anything, which is kind of surprising. So here is a theorem. This theorem is uh, due to, I guess the version I'm going to give you is due to Raghavendra and Tan, but really more or less the same thing was proven kind of independently by many other people. So there is also Baps here, uh, there's Perkins, and there's Koja, Oglan, and there is another independent paper by Montanari that does almost the same thing. And the theorem says the following thing. This is for any measure new, okay, one. Uh, it says that for any new, but it's only on minus one, one to the end. And any, I guess, number L between one and N, there exists a subset of coordinates subset of the n-coordinates such that the following holds 
Uh, so suppose that x is new distributed, then we have that the, ex, uh, the expectation over the vector x conditioned on the coordinates in S of the average covariance between two coordinates. So here we have 1 over n choose 2 sum of i and j in n choose 2 of the covariance between xi and xj conditioned on x sub s square is at most some constant over L. I think if I put this up, let's try. Yeah. Bummer. Uh, maybe I put this down. I, yeah. I, like this. Ah, OK. I guess you don't need to know the name. You already saw that. So what does this tell us? I run, I think this already partially answers your question. Even for the easing model. Ah, of course. Thanks. Uh, there exists S of size at most L. So what does, it, what does it tell us? So for, for example, just imagine you know the two-dimensional easing model where you could have long-range correlations. The covariances could be, the, the entries of the covariance matrix could be, all of them could be pretty big, or almost all of them. It's enough to just condition on you know, a constant number of coordinates, or just a super constant number of coordinates, and conditioned on that, all of the correlations go to zero. I think it's a pretty cool fact. Xs is the core. It's, it's just, I look at the coordinates of x, only the ones inside. It. Yeah, yeah. The, ah, you asked projection. Yes, it's the projection. OK? So, so this is a. I guess there it's several years, but Montanari was the first, and it's 2009. But I guess all of these gave slightly weaker things. This is, I think, 2014. I'm not sure. Something like that. Sorry? It's actually almost true for a random subset S. So yes. Uh, good. So this is their theorem, which kind of, you know, it almost gives L2. Not quite, but almost. And so it, this is for any measure on the discrete hypercube. Sorry? Ah, no. I, I mean, it can't be the same for all measures, because otherwise it's true for any. I mean, for any measure, there exists a subset of the coordinates, small one, that if you know those coordinates, then up to that, all the others are almost pairwise independent. S, of course, depends on the measure. Um, let's, I, okay, I don't want to get, I mean, I, let me go on to like other theorems and the proofs and then maybe we'll understand better in what way you should expect it to depend. Uh, okay. So here's. Second theorem. Huh? 
which is stronger in several ways. Let me, uh, let me first write the theorem and then uh, explain it in which way it's stronger. So, uh, so now it's not only going to be on the discrete hypercube, it's for any uh, mu on any space. It could be discrete, it could be Rn. Uh, but let's, for convenience, let's say that the covariance of mu is the identity. And for any new absolutely continuous with respect to mu, and for any matrix L which is positive definite, There exists a measure M on some index set such that, first of all, uh, two stars holds. Uh, so I guess there exists a measure M and those measures new theta such that this decomposition, is it still there? Yes. Uh, it holds, and we have the following thing. So note that now our measure is, you know, it's not, dis not necessarily discreetly supported. In this theorem, we knew that, you know, the decomposition is just finite. You get the decomposition into two to the L components. If you're in a continuous setting, the most you can say is, you know, what we have here in number two. We have that, first of all, the entropy with respect to mu of mu theta and expectation of over theta is bigger or equal than the entropy of nu minus uh, log of the determinant of the identity plus L times, hold on, sorry. Actually, just that. The second move to here. How M and mu are re related with L? Sorry? How M and mu are related with L? Ah, I, when I'm finished, you'll see. Okay, sorry. For now, it's just uh, the second thing we have is that, let me just make sure I'm not, okay. Uh, yes. The expected covariance of uh, mu theta times L like this is dominated by the identity. So if L is big, it means that most new thetas have small covariance. And the third thing we have is that the for a typical measure new, if I take, um, yeah, is, yes, this is also dominated by the identity. So, I mean, do those two are kind of similar to each other, but 
not exactly. Okay, so this, this theorem is a bit stronger than this theorem. First of all, we don't do require anything on the background measure. It doesn't even have to be a product measure. It can just be anything. Second, we have this freedom to choose our matrix L in the way that L determines which directions of mu theta we want to make smaller. Right? In the directions that L is big, mu theta has to be kind of small. This is helpful because, for example, for Ising models, sometimes we know that all of the eigenvalues of the matrix J just point in, you know, very specific directions. In this case, we just want our measures to have small covariance in those specific directions. Okay? So this is the first theorem. And the second theorem that I want to... So, so this theorem basically gives L1 and L2, right? More or less. And now for L4, I claim that L4 cannot be true for all new. For some measures, this is just too much to hope for. So one reason for this is that if, this were, if, you, if you had such a theorem that gives L4 for all measures, then you would know that all measures admit some kind of mean field approximation. And we know that this is just not true. It's not true for Ising models on constant degree graphs. So for L4, we really need you know, to know something about the measure nu. And there turns out to be a pretty natural condition, or several pretty natural conditions. Uh, Sorry? L is just any positive definite matrix. Am I missing something? I mean, you, you have some trade-off, right? If it's big, then you don't have a good bound for the entropy, but you have better bounds for the covariance. So you, you want some trade-off between this and these. This is for Ising models such that the matrix, yes, so yes. So for Ising model, both these theorems allow you to get approximations. This, this just gives a slightly better than what this allows. But so even say for critical Ising models, it's two dimensional approximation. So no. So for critical Ising models, the mini field approximation is just not true. So I just, I just didn't say, I, I guess it's not written anymore, but even if you have a good, a, a good estimate for the covariance matrix, it doesn't necessarily mean that when you integrate the potential with respect to your original measure and the product measure, it's almost the same. So it turns out that what you also need is for the eigenvectors of, okay, you, you kind of, I guess what you kind of need is for the graph to have degree tending to uh, infinity. So mean field is true for graphs with large degrees. It's just not true for constant degree graphs. And on the ZD lattices, D goes infinity, you get better and better now. Yes. Yeah, that is true. And that all works pretty nicely. Ah, uh, good. So, um, let me very quickly just give you a condition for L4 to hold true. This is a theorem from, I guess, 
2017 or something, which says the following. If I look at the expectation, I take a Gaussian in Rn, just a standard Gaussian, and I look at the expectation of the supremum over x, uh, the scalar product between the Gaussian and the gradient of the potential at the point x. So a gradient could be either a discrete gradient or a continuous gradient. If I know that this guy is little o of n, so in some sense the set of possible gradients of the function is small, then uh, I guess let's just say two stars with L4 holds true. So somehow if you don't have a lot of gradients, then you have a much better, you, in a much better sense, your pure states are close to product. And uh, I should mention that there are not exactly extensions, but uh, so, so this is a measure of complexity that has to do with the Gaussian width of the set of gradients. There are two other theorems, one by uh, Tim Austin and the other by Fanny uh, Ogiri, which uh, give a slightly different condition for such thing to hold true. I guess this one is 2018 and this is uh, 19 plus. Uh, in terms of small covering number, of the image of the gradient of F. which also give uh, L4. How much time do I have? Not very long, I guess zero, minus one. Okay, so I don't have time to give you some ideas of the proof, but maybe, you know. Okay, nothing, then. Yes. So all of these theorems have to do with uh, decomposition of measure, decompositions of measures on the queue. And I, I, I mean, I, what is the question, actually? So how, how similar is it to, to, this, to this kind of decomposition? To this one? Ah, ah very, it's, it's, it's different. It's actually, so these two things just look at the set where the gradients of F are just pointing. Or it's just a net over the set of gradients and, ju and just, this is, this is going to be your partition of the measure mean. Uh -huh. And uh, in your last theorem, you already consider something like smoothness of F. Did you consider the connection between these two processes? So first of all, no. I'm not aware of these theorems. I, I mean, same, seems interesting. Let, let me just point out here that smoothness is really not enough in a sense. You could have a smooth function. It's not clear what smooth means exactly, uh, where the set of gradients still kind of spans all directions. This condition, in some sense, is much stronger than just C2 Lipschitz or, or really any, con any local condition on some you know, derivative being small in the soup norm. Yeah, but they have different conditions. It makes sense to Sure. Second question is about your first theorem. Is it 
something about normal submetric, some result. What you have metric, some norm, some condition of the metrics, and you look for a submetric, small submetric with good properties. Are are you asking if that's the proof more or less? Yeah. No. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it seems connected, but really it's not. I mean, the, the, the measures you get have nothing to do with coordinate subspaces. Actually, it's, you can find examples where coordinate subspaces are not going to be good for this case, whereas they are good for this case, as the theorem shows. So, So are, are you asking if whether this theorem has a corollary in the spirit of the, of the first question? The answer is yes, and it improves on some other bounds in the literature that use uh, this thing. And actually also Fanny has another improvement that uses a completely different technique. So actually there is like by now several ways to approach the first question, at least for easing models which have this mean field, high degree uh, property. Are there classical systems of statistical physics for which this uh, is mostly what we talk about? Think, like, so, just, like, I don't know, maybe general just, just look at uh, the easing model on a random deregular graph, for example, and, and you want to see what the dependence of mean field approximation on D is. So, uh, so yes, it, it improved it. By now there is another improvement over this, but, but at the time, yeah. Yes, in this case. 